Open up your Bible with me. Uh, we're gonna be in John uh, chapter 12, and then we're actually gonna go back to John chapter six. So we're gonna be in the Gospel of John, and uh, I'm gonna be starting a new series that's gonna take us through the next six weeks, and been really excited about this one, been studying a lot, and stirred up to share. And the title of my message today, and I'll share the sermon series title in the message, but the title of my message today is, I'm hanging on his words. I'm hanging on his words. There's a lot of people saying a lot of stuff, uh, but we need to hang on his words. And in uh, John chapter 12, verse 47, Jesus is talking, and this is what he says. He says, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I love what Jesus said, I don't judge them. He says, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. And then in John chapter six, verse 60, Jesus has kind of just got done preaching and he's preaching some really difficult things, right? In, in earlier in John chapter six, he's saying things like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. And people are like, okay, I didn't know I was in a cannibalism cult. Cool, okay, right? Kind of starting to hear some weird things. And, and then he would say things like, hey, your father's, ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. So now not only are they not understanding, now they're offended. And I don't know if there's a worse position to be in than I'm offended and I don't really understand what's going on. And in John chapter six, verse 60, Jesus finishes this message and it says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, do you take offense at this? And I, I wanna skip down for the sake of time to verse 66. It says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Now, Jesus didn't just have the 12 disciples. He had a lot of disciples. And in verse 67, it says, so Jesus said to the 12, do you wanna go away as well? And Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are, are the Holy One of God. I'm hanging on his words. Come on, let's pray together today over the preaching of God's word. Uh, God, thank you so much for the honor it is, Lord, to gather in an environment like this, to hear your words, to be encouraged and built up and corrected by your words. Lord, I, I pray, God, that we would submit ourselves before your word. We're grateful for you today. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. Amen. Uh, have you ever seen somebody start to put something together and you're watching them do it wrong? Have you ever found yourself in this situation? You're watching somebody put something together. Uh, maybe they're, they're building something or maybe they're cooking something and you're like, no, no, no. Uh, they're, just, they're just doing it wrong. This is how I felt the first time I saw Christina make Top Ramen. Now, Christina is an amazing cook. She's, she's an incredible cook. Um, but, and, and there's not many things, if anything, besides this, that I cook better than her, but I can, I, I, I want to boast in this. I am better at making top ramen than Christina. Now, some of you are like, how often do you eat top ramen regularly? Okay. If you're too good for top ramen, you're too good for me. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and I'm just better. And I remember the first time I saw her making it, I was like, what are you doing? Like the, like the timing of when she was putting in the seasoning, how her, her, her water to noodle quotient and breakdown, it, it was just it, it was just all wrong, and, and so I, so I had, I had to show her how to, I had to show her how to, how to put it together, and, we, and we've all kind of been in environments where, where people were putting together things, and you're like, ah, I don't know if you're putting that together correctly. What I wanna do before we really get into the meat of this series for the next six weeks is I wanna share with you how I've developed my theology and how I've put together uh, and oriented my theology uh, over the last 20 plus years that I've been following Jesus. 
Be, because I, I do really believe this. How you put your theology together, and theology is just a, a way of thinking about God. How you've constructed this and oriented this is very, very important for what's gonna come out on the other side. And so as the pastor of Grace City Church, I, I wanna take you through, hey, hey, here's three things that are governing and deciding my theology. So the first one is this. I'm gonna give you three things if you're taking notes. The first thing is this, is what is the consistent tone of scripture from Genesis to Revelation? So what is the consistent, uh, what is God's view on different things that remains consistent from Genesis to Revelation? And the reason why the consistency from Genesis to Revelation is so key is because how many of you have known somebody that can make the Bible say whatever they want it to say? Right, come on, we all know people that, oh man, they can, and the way that they can do that is that they can cherry pick one verse in one area and go, oh, this is what the Bible says about this. Like, right, but the Bible is a collection of books that were put together so that we can really understand the heart and the nature and the way that God works by understanding who he has been from Genesis to Revelation. So you have to take the sum totality of the scripture, put them together. The other thing that helps guide my theology is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. The Bible says this, that God has written his word where? On our hearts. Scriptures also say that wisdom cries out in the streets. So there is an element, there is a discerning element to your theology and my theology. So, so as we read Genesis to Revelation, we begin to understand the nature of God and how he's worked. There's also a wisdom cries out in the streets. This is why sometimes, do you ever see like data like, oh, they did a study telling us that fill in the blank and uh, I could have saved them a lot of money and a lot of time doing the study. Like, oh, they discovered that and you're like, right, wisdom cries out in the streets. We already knew that. We didn't need a study. We didn't need, like, like, we knew that. And then the third thing that governs my theology, and by the way, these are all working in connection at the same time. It's not like you put this hat on and then you put this hat. These all work together. And the third one is this, is the life and words of Christ. The ministry of Jesus, right? That has to be a major focus on how your theology is developed and oriented. And the reason why is in the Gospel of John, what, like what does it say? It says that the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us, right? At the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and then the word became flesh in the incarnation of Christ. Now what that is to say is when you read the Bible, come on, you ever read the Bible and you're like, oh, I wonder what the application is there. Right, you read the Bible and you're like, what would that look like for me to live that out? We have it. His name is Jesus. Right, and so if you wanna know, okay, what would it look like for like God to live out his word, we have that in the person of Jesus. And so what we're gonna do for the next six weeks is we're gonna look at some, I don't know if controversial is the right word, but some statements that Jesus made. Right, some, some thoughts that he has about some things. And so the title of our series, I, I thought this was fun, but I came up with it. Tell me if you like it. But the title of our sermon series is, oh, he said that? The title of our series for the next six weeks is, oh, he said that? And we're gonna look at some things that Jesus said. And I love, because I wanna start in this place of authority. Because if we don't start in a place of authority, then the series and our theology will break down. My main point today is this, is that the words of Jesus must first be heard, secondly understood, so that we can ultimately surrender to them. Right, that is the whole point. The point is not to memorize some things that Jesus said so you have a quick comeback to your friend that isn't following Jesus. The goal of the words of Jesus must first be heard, Secondly, understood, so that you and I can ultimately surrender to the words of Jesus. And in John chapter 12, verse 49, this is what he says. This is so key in this whole thing. He says, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment on what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. <laughs> we all have listened to somebody who clearly didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> you ever listen to somebody and they're talking 
And the people that are the most fascinating to me are when people speak with such confidence. And by the way, I think this is, I find this admirable. Like when somebody has so much confidence and you're sitting there, you're like, bro, you are dead wrong. You are just absolute, but, but, but because of the gravita, right? because of the strength and because of the forcefulness with what they are saying, it, it, it's like, uh, like okay, like it, it, it feels legit. This is why, by the way, you can't be deceived just because something comes across as authoritative, right? B -b because we all know things that came across as authoritative that proved not to be. We all experienced this in our weather app. We've all experienced in this weather app. Now, I don't even know this is possible, but I, I remember a while ago, I looked at the weather, right? And because we, we, we look at our weather app to try to figure out what our game plan is for a day. And one particular day, I looked at the weather app and it said, there is 100% chance of rain at one o'clock. 100%. Now, I don't know where and when you come from, but when somebody says 100%, or when somebody says something like, I guarantee it, that means something where I come from. And so I remember at 9 a.m. looking at the weather app. Oh, we got to change our day. We got to change our plans because there's a 100% chance that it's going to rain at 1 o'clock. I looked at that thing an hour later. And it said 85% chance. And I was like, bro, that's not what you told me an hour ago. You said you were certain, you said 100, you didn't say 98%. You didn't give yourself an out. You said there is a 100% chance. Of, you know what you and I do all the time? We believe people just because they say, I guarantee it. We believe people just because they speak with authority like, or at least some sort of gravitas. We, we, and we gotta be careful that we, we gotta stop doing that. And we, we gotta have, start having a healthy, authoritative Structure. This is why, by the way, I, I'm always very careful to teach our preaching time about speaking within their authority. Like we talk about that on our preaching team when we're, when we're talking to our staff. Say, hey, make sure you're preaching within your authority. What I mean by that is like if we had somebody that was like single from our church and they were up here preaching, they ought not give us five points to have a great marriage. Right? It's like, it's like, oh, why? Because you're speaking outside of your authority. This is why I don't tell people how to raise godly kids. I don't know yet. I don't know. It's been five weeks. One of my kids was pumped to come today. One of them didn't want to come. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm on the journey. <laughs> what? Speaking within your authority. Here's why that's so important. Because there is something profound that happens when somebody is operating within their authority. Conversely, there's something incredibly awkward that takes place when somebody is not. There's something unnatural when somebody is operating outside of their theology, uh, their authority. And we're not always the great, we're not always the best at discerning this. Like I remember one time, it was like 14 years ago, I was on staff at a church and I was going through a very difficult season um, uh, with kind of like my, my, my family and, and, and things of that nature. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'm the only one here that has had family drama. And I was in one of those, <laughs> I was in one of those, I was, I was too real, didn't get the laugh, I was too real, my bad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Too real of a joke. And, and, and there was a lot of drama going on with my family, very, very serious stuff. And, and, and my pastor knew and my executive pastor knew and I was, I was on staff of this church. And, um, and there was this guy that was, that was also on staff of the church and we were friendly, but we weren't friends. You know, people you work with, you know, it's like, we're friendly, but we're not like boys. You know, we don't talk about, you know, what's going on in our hearts and stuff like that. And I, I remember I was going through one of the most difficult seasons of my life. And you know, when you're going through like a really difficult season, you don't got time for the nonsense. <laughs> And I was in one of those kind of just like seasons. And, uh, and I'm walking down the hallway and, and, and this coworker's like, hey, Andrew, come here. Hey, come into my office. And I'm like, oh, okay. I go, go into his office. I sit down. And I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? And he goes, hey, man, I heard about what's going on in your family. And I, I just want to see you, man. Are you okay? I go, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm good. I tried to let him off the hook. I was trying to be gracious. I said, yeah, I'm good. And he goes, oh, uh, I, I know, but man, this is like very heavy stuff that you're dealing with. Like, are you okay? And again, I was at the end of it, so I was just like over it, you know? And so I just started laughing. 
I just started laughing. I go, oh, man, <laughs> um, I have people for this, and you're not one of them. <laughs> and I just got up and walked out. And, and, and what was I, I'm a joy to work with. And, and <laughs> but what was, I, what was I communicating? This is not your area of authority. You, you, you don't have authority in this. You want to know what I think one of our biggest problems is we have no hierarchy of authority. There's no hierarchy of authority. There's, 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 there's no method by which we are going, who has the voice in our life and why do they have such influence? And there are people in our life that we ought to give more authority to and there's people in our life that we probably have to give less authority to. Life is about authority. In fact, a key part of how we relate to Jesus is found in the authority that his voice has in our lives. And it's all oriented around this question, is he and the Father one? Is he God? Because if Jesus is actually God to you, I would submit to you that you should put him at the top of the authority list. And interesting things happen when we do not have a hierarchy of authority. And one of two things will either happen. If you have no hierarchy of authority, one of two things will happen. You'll either be confused or rebellious. If you have no hierarchy of authority, you'll either be confused or rebellious. You'll be confused if everyone carries the same weight because then you will listen to the wrong people. So if you have no hierarchy of authority when it comes to people's voice in your life, you will, you will take bad advice. You wanna know why you'll take bad advice? It's because you'll listen to whoever talked to you last. Just whoever you had the audience with last is the person. In fact, I found myself getting annoyed one time. I was talking to a young person and, and we were having a conversation and they were asking my counsel and asking my thoughts about things. And, and, and I said, oh, and I was just curious. I wasn't even fishing. I was just curious. Said, who, who all are you talking to about this? And they go, oh, well, I'm talking to you and I'm, ta and, and I'm talking to my two roommates. I said, how old are they, 19? And I'm talking to this person, that person. And then I'm gonna kind of like put all those together and then I'm gonna make a decision. I was like, bro, meeting's over. Meeting's over. And they were like, w w w why? I said, because you're gonna talk to me and I'm gonna give you some sound advice from some experience. And then you're gonna go talk to your idiot roommate. <laughs> and because he's gonna be the last one that you talk to at 10 o'clock at night while you guys are sitting down playing PlayStation, <laughs> that's gonna be the advisory. And I just wasted an hour you will be confused if all these voices have the same weight or <laughs> you'll be rebellious. Because how many of you know this? You can always find a friend to co-sign on some wild stuff. You can always find a friend that can co-sign on some wild, like your friend went through a divorce and then you're struggling in your marriage and they're like, hey, what do you think I should do? What do you think your divorced friend's gonna say? They want someone to go out with. I mean, I, and so we have to be careful. We have, like, not everybody should have the same voice in your life. Some of you, you like, you're adults, you still give too big of a voice to your parents. You give too big a voice, to, and not because your parents are bad people. Some of you just have unhealthy parents. And you're still listening to them in the same way that you used to listen to them when you were 13. You don't have to keep doing that. You're an adult. You, you, you better have a hierarchy of how this plays out. And the place that it has to start is, Jesus, you have the ultimate authority. You are sitting on the top of this hierarchy place. You have to establish that. Why? Because because his word does judge us. I love Jesus says, I don't judge you. I'm here to save, but what I say does. <laughs> Why? Jesus is saying, because I'm gonna say some things that are for your flourishing, and if you just buck them, or if you just put that in the same counsel as other counsel that you get, then, then that is gonna judge you. This is why I'm hanging on his words. Why? Because he has the authority. Not because they always make me feel warm and fuzzy, but because they are the way of life. And then in, I wanna go back to John chapter six. 
verse 60, because Jesus is, is preaching this hard message. And in verse 60, it says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he says to them, do you take offense at this? See, there are two things that make something hard for us. Two, two things that make something hard for us. One is we don't understand it. And the other is we don't like it. Those are the two reasons why when we hear something, we hear the words of Jesus, we hear the words from a, a pastor, we, we, we hear the words from a trusted friend, from a confidant, uh, we either don't like it because we either don't understand it or we really, we just, we don't like it. We, we don't like what's being said. I, I remember I was talking to a SCU professor one time, we were out to lunch, and this is when I was the campus pastor at SCU, and, 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 and we're having lunch. Um, a brilliant guy, incredibly brilliant guy. And so I was understanding like every fourth word. You ever have a conversation like with somebody and, and they're just talking at a level and you're like, I'm understanding like every fourth word of what you're saying. And he's on this diatribe and he's speaking passionately. And, and, and so I'm just giving him the obligatory like, uh-huh, totally, yep. I'm just giving him the feedback and he's going for like 30 minutes. And at the end of this 30 minute just diatribe that he was on, he goes, and that's why, Andrew, what you do is so vital. <laughs> so to this day, I don't understand why what I do is so vital. <laughs> So that's, we just don't understand things. Can I tell you, there are things in the scriptures, and I do this for like a living, there are things in the scriptures that I just have question marks around. There are things in the scriptures that I'm like, I don't understand that yet. Like, like I, I'm, I'm not sure how that plays out. And that can be frustrating. The people in this scripture, Jesus is saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't be my disciple. And they're like, I don't get it. Or sometimes we just don't like what's being said. Like I remember when I got saved, I was 17 years old, I got saved, uh, uh, started going to church and, and my pastor and I would meet and there were things I just didn't know. Like there were a lot of things that I liked about church. There were a lot of things I liked about being a Christian when I got saved. I, I loved, I just felt clean. And, and if you got saved, like I mean for real saved, like all the way saved, like cooked through, it's like you feel like, man, I just took a shower for the first time. That, like those songs that we were singing, man, I can't believe that I get to experience this grace. And, and so there were a lot of things I liked. There were some things I was not a fan of. And I remember two things in particular that when my pastor was sitting me down, talking to me about what the Bible says about two things in particular. In fact, I remember this so distinctly. I remember how the coffee shop smelled. I remember like just the, the feel. And it was because he told me two things. One is I did not know this, like, hey, sex outside of marriage is like sin. <laughs> like, I'm glad I didn't know that when I signed up for this thing. It was a revelation to me. I go, word? And so then I was doing everything but, my pastor was like, no, that's not, not exactly what purity is, right? And, and then he began to talk to me about like tithing, like how to steward my finances in a godly way. And I was like, this sucks. <laughs> and there were just some things I didn't like. Like, like there were some things, principles in the scripture, like I liked a lot of it. A lot of it was very helpful. A lot of it was like, I'm forgiven. <laughs> I like that part. I'm called and chosen. I'm a son of God. Darn right I am. But then, but then Jesus had some more opinions. He had some thoughts about what holiness is and how he designed me. And isn't that wild that the person who created me has some thoughts about how I am to operate? And we're in this position and in this posture to where we are confronted with things that we either don't understand or things that we just don't like. And the question is, well, what do you do in those moments? How do you operate? in those moments. Because if you're following Jesus right now, you're gonna agree with Jesus like 80 to 95% of the time. You're gonna read your Bible, I'm gonna get up here and preach, you're gonna agree with like 80 to 95% of it. So the question isn't, I mean, yes, it's in part, 
right? Because we're all growing and none of us are living up to this thing, right? Holy, right? So, so it does matter what you do with the parts that you agree with, but the real fundamental question is what do you do with that other five to 20%? What do you do when you're, when you're confronted with that five to 20%? Also, if you're in this room and you're not following Jesus uh, and you're not under the authority of, of him, l- let me just kind of tell you something. Like, you're under the same authority. Now, your percentages might look different. You, you, you might, maybe you come here and you're trying to figure out who Jesus is and, 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 and what this church thing is all about. And so your percentages might look like, I agree with Jesus 30% of the time or 40% of the time. The, the percentages are, are relative, relatively irrelevant, but you're here and you're going, I don't know. You're, you're under the same authority. The scriptures tell us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In, in fact, I, I know there's a lot of like controversy right now around the Olympics and like uh, what they did at like the opening ceremonies and they kind of made fun of the um, Last Supper painting and, 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 and kind of did all this. And to be honest, when I see stuff like that, like, I, I, know, I know we get worked up and, and, and it's sacrilegious and I totally agree with all that. Don't email me or if you're gonna email Christina. But can I just tell you what, what my initial thought is? My initial thought is, be careful. I, I, I wouldn't play. <laughs> be, be, because you can buck authority all you want. Like, it's like my kids. There's a certain degree that I'll let them buck my authority. There's a, there, there's, there's a, certain, there's a certain measure but there's always a moment where it comes time for me to impose my will and my will will get imposed. And so the question for you and I is, man, what are we doing with that other 5%, that 20%, that 50%, that 70%? And what I always go back to is, Lord, when I don't understand you or when I don't agree with you, I wanna submit to you. And this is coming from somebody who loves to debate. I want to have the team come up. I want to finish. I'll preach all day. I've been in five weeks. <laughs> now, I love to debate. Who in here, like, you love to debate? Like, let me see your hand. You love to debate. Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who in here, like, you don't like it? It's too, it's too like, aggressive. You won't even raise your hand. I don't even know why. <laughs> uh, it's aggressive. <laughs> I love to debate. I love to talk about topics. I love to talk about like debate really serious topics. And I like to talk about, about other topics. I love debating sports things. Like I love talking about like GOAT, MJ or LeBron. It's obvious. I, like I love it. And the problem with that is I gotta be careful that that doesn't carry into my faith. You, you wanna know what's something that I audibly pray? This is something that I, that I audibly pray. Lord, If ever my will is at odds with yours, let my will bend. If ever my will is at odds with your will, Lord, I pray that my will would be the one. Some of you, you you have too many conversations with God. You have too many conversations with God. I I know you and I, man, we want to understand everything and we want to figure it out. And I got questions, man. I got, I want to talk to a manager. (laughs) We just live in that day and age. You know what I mean? Like we're unhappy with service, like at Southwest Air, blah. Like, it's like, we just live in that day and age, right? Like, I I want to talk to somebody. Like, Like, I want, like, you know what I found? I can just speak for myself. You want to know what I found in my relationship with God? I waste a lot of time when I do that. I'm just wasting a lot of time going, God, I don't agree with that. And I'm, and, and, or sometimes, you ever do this? You ever agree with God, but then you're the martyr, you're the sacrificial one? Not the one who came to earth and forfeited his rights as God and went to the cross and got beaten. Like, no, I, I, I'm the sacrificial one because, you know, I said no to that thing. You and I are not the martyrs in this story. I know it's not vogue. I know it's not cool to talk about things like authority right now, but I think we have just lost the story. We just have lost the story of Jesus, you are God. Like, I know people, man. 
I know people that will say things like, and I'm talking about people that know God. I know they know God. But they'll say things like, I know what the Bible says, but and don't think, right, none of us are that self-righteous. We could all find ourselves there just justifying things we want to do. I know what the Bible says, but I know what Jesus says, but but then we don't understand authority. Then we don't understand authority. And, and these disciples leave and Jesus looks at his 12 and he says, are you gonna go too? And Simon Peter answers him. This is one where Peter just got it right. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. There are going to be moments in your life where the exit is the most appealing. There's gonna be moments in your life where the exit is most, man, I like that church thing until somebody hurt my feelings at a city group. Man, I, I like that church thing until they started talking about money. Man, I like that church thing until I tried out for that and I couldn't sing good enough and they only like good singers, true. They only let the good people sing. Correct. Fact check true. We all don't want to endure your hobby. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> But that's what we do, right? And there's always going to come a moment where the, the exit just seems the most appealing. I don't understand or I don't agree. I want to exit. In the greatest marriages I know, the, the, the healthiest of marriages, there's always like one or two times that if you weren't gonna make it, and I talk to married couples all the time, and they can point back to one or two times, if we weren't gonna make it, that's where we wouldn't have made it. In the best marriages. Oh man, if we weren't gonna make it. And you know what I found? I tell people that are struggling, is going, hey, you don't gotta hold on forever. You just gotta hold on for right now. Just like right now. And you're gonna look back at this go, oh man, if there would've been t a time that I would've left, it would've been that time. I think sometimes like, like we forget that in our faith journey with God. You don't gotta like hold on, like not every season of your relationship with Jesus is this like self-sacrificial, oh man, I gotta do that. Not every season in your walk with Jesus is gonna be that. But there will be some. And there'll be a couple moments where you'll be able to look back and go, man, if I was ever gonna stop following Jesus, it would have been that season. Like I can tell you 14 years ago, I had a season where if I was ever gonna be out, it would have been 14 years ago. Because of everything that was going on with my family. And, and, and so now it's like, I'm not going anywhere. Not because like every day is like, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's because 14 years ago, it was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. But the disciples, they say, no, man, we're not going anywhere. Why? Because we know your words have life. And even when I don't understand it, like I do right now, and even when I don't agree with it, like I do right now, Jesus, you are still the authority. I am created, you are creator. That is the nature of our exchange. That is the nature of our relationship. And the better that you and I can understand that, the more we'll be able to submit to the words of God, even when we don't understand it, and even when it's hard. Come on, let's stand to our feet, Grace City.